Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner. I'm here today with my awesome dermatology residents and Dermpath fellows, and we're going to do a sweat gland tumor extravaganza. Lots of awesome sweat gland tumors today. All right, uh, case one, who uh, knows what this is? Yeah, hydradenoma, very good. And it's sometimes called nodular and cystic hydradenoma, right? Because um, you tend to get lots of cystic spaces, and then you can have solid areas that form nodules. The ducts in hydradenoma can range from being these small little tubules like this that are lined by a little layer of cuboidal cells. Sometimes you can see kind of apocrine snouting. Um, and then other areas, these are actually duct spaces, just big, huge, dilated duct spaces that form these cysts. All right, and they tend to be seated down in the deep dermis, although sometimes they can actually connect to the epidermis, um, which I feel like is not taught enough, but I've seen many times in practice. And the um, cytology of the, the cells that make up um, hydradenoma, which is also known as acrospiroma, um, is the cells tend to be uniform population and have kind of pink to clear or pale cytoplasm. They kind of look squamoid to me, like they look like keratinocytes because of the abundant pink cytoplasm. Um, and usually we teach there's one cell population, although in this one you can kind of see two because there's like kind of an inner lining on some of the tubules. Hydronoma can have a wide range of appearances. And I always like to say, if you see something that you think is a sweat gland tumor, uh, but you don't know how to classify it, and it's a test, guess hydradenoma or guess mixed tumor because both of those have are relatively common and have a wide range of different features. And then here's a nice example of the clear cell change from glycogen filled uh, cells. And they can, uh, sometimes you can have dramatic clearing of like all the cells and it can really closely mimic a renal cell carcinoma. Um, in that setting, the, my favorite stain to do would be like a P63 or a P40, which is positive in hydradenoma strong and diffuse and in the majority of sweat gland tumors actually and and basically all most um care uh, most epidermal tumors from the skin are going to express p63 or p40 and then are going to be negative in renal cell so there are other markers but if you ever run into that usually you can sort it out on h and e and then note the dense basement membrane which is a common feature in not only hydradenoma but in in many different sweat gland and other adnexal tumors look there's a little bit of that kind of apocrine snouting that you can sometimes see so nice hydradenoma, nodular, and cystic. All right, case two. What's this? Mucinous carcinoma. Yeah, good. This is mucinous carcinoma. And you can tell right now, look where we are. We've got skeletal muscle bundles down here with their peripheral nuclei or if you see them cut in longitudinal section, you, uh, maybe not on this scan, but you can appreciate the striations. So we're in the eyelid probably, right? Where we've got a lot of skeletal muscle close to the face. There's a little hair shaft with a giant cell around it from a ruptured hair follicle. And here, which is just incidental, I don't know why I told you that, but I saw it and I thought it was interesting. So um, here we have pools of blue mucin and we've got islands of tumor cells floating in the pools. This one is not nearly as dramatic as some that I've seen. Uh, most of the time they tend to have monotonous, relatively bland um, actually tumor cells, not usually super ugly and pleomorphic in my experience. And they're floating in these pools. Now metastatic mucinous carcinoma, which in my experience is quite rare to see in the skin, but it is possible. So when you're near the eyelid, it almost, I've never seen a metastatic mucinous carcinoma in the skin at the eyelid or near the eye. Uh, in fact, I think I've only seen maybe one mucinous carcinoma met the skin in my whole career. So it happens, people get really concerned about it, but the vast majority of times when I see mucinous carcinoma, it ends up being a primary. But if there's concern or if the patient has a history, you know, they could do scans or workup. Um, one thing that can be really helpful is if you find an in situ component. You'll see an area that looks kind of like a hydrocystoma and has solid areas growing in it and then transitioning the mucinous carcinoma. That is basically definitively a primary tumor if you find that. We don't have that in this case. And that, that kind of precursor form is, uh, is also known as endocrine producing sweat gland carcinoma, which is kind of a complicated topic, but it's thought to be a, an in situ precursor lesion, kind of that... Um, it turns into mucinous carcinoma in some cases. That's a very simplified uh, version of that story. I also want to point out while we're here, what are these cells? 
Look at these big eyeballs looking up at us here. Well, these cells are the same as these cells, which are the same as these cells. They're all skeletal muscle bundles. This is skeletal muscle atrophy. See, because we had hair follicle rupture here, probably somehow related to the tumor, or maybe they, oh, actually, you know what? I bet they may have, maybe they biopsied it before. I don't know. But here is a ruptured follicle, and as a side effect of that, we are getting, um, we're getting some uh, reactive, atrophic and reactive um, atypia in the skeletal muscle, which can look really bizarre. Always good to pay attention to that. So they're um, mucinous uh, carcinoma of the eyelid. Case three, cylindroma, that's right. And they are blue tumors usually, whereas, you know, the hydradenoma we looked at earlier is more of a pink tumor most of the time. Cylindroma and spiradenoma, which are basically like, like uh, brothers or sisters, they're, they're very closely related. Um, they are very blue and basaloid from low power. And when you go in closer, you can see that the, the individual nests fit and mold together with each other. People have likened this to puzzle pieces. Um, my uh, fellow uh, Ed Fulton, several years ago, we wrote a paper about sweat gland uh, and adnexal tumors. Uh, it's in Archives of Pathology. It's uh, aimed for general pathologists and, and non-derm paths. So um, I will actually put a link in the video description if you're watching this online. Um, in any case, he had the really great uh, analogy that these look kind of like the spots on giraffes. And I, I actually really like that, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone else use that. So um, unless someone comes and tells me otherwise, I'm going to say that that's an Ed Fulton original. So thank you, Ed, for that. Ed's the same guy that came up with the ramen noodle sign. He, he had lots of great visual analogies. So look, when you go closer to these things, they are blue cells. And people like to talk about that there's two populations. There's these really small, dark blue nuclei. And then there's a bigger kind of like pale purple nuclei. I find that that's, that's fine and all, but um, I don't feel like that's an easy way to teach it to beginners, um, even though it is technically true. But I think the molded blue puzzle pieces or giraffe spots, and then the really dense basement membrane. Um, we showed basement membrane present in hydradenoma a minute ago, but it's it's really much more prominent usually in cylindromas and spiradenomas. So in cylindromas, you tend to get basement membrane wrapping around each individual nest like this, like like a like a kid took a pink crayon or marker and made an outline, a perfect outline. Maybe not a kid, maybe like a, an adult, because it's like so perfectly drawn or a really artistic kid. My kids actually draw better than I do, so maybe I shouldn't be ageist like that. But in any case, the pink layer on the outside, and then look, these blobs or globules or droplets, whatever name you like, of pink basement membrane, collagen type four, embedded in the tumor islands. Look at that. If you don't like that, I don't know how to help you. I mean, that's beautiful, right? That's amazing. So look, the, um, the other thing is that these are sweat gland tumors, but the ducts sometimes are very focal and small, whereas you have abundant duct spaces and cysts in hydradenomas, spiradenoma and cylindroma tend to be very focal a lot of times. So here you can see them. Here's one duct right here. Now, this is not a duct. That is a blood vessel, actually. Here's a duct right here. And the ducts have a very discreet, sharply circumscribed little space, usually often lined by a little pink layer called a cuticle, which is kind of hard to show as well. Oh, there, that's better right there. See there, see how they're like perfect, like punched out little hole, like with a little hole punch. Um, and then they've got a nice little layer of pink around them. And that cuticle can kind of help you to tell, yes, it's a true duct right there, rather than um, an artifactual hole, all right? And then also look at the, the stroma here. It's got a lot of very pale edema. You often have a lot of edema around cylindromas and spiradenomas. And again, these are related. And oftentimes you'll see an area that has cylindroma and spiradenoma, like a hybrid uh, tumor. Okay, so that's a very nice example of a cylindroma. And of course, these can be seen in uh, sporadically, but also in certain syndromes like Brooks Spiegler. Okay, what's this? Yeah, very tangentially cut poroma. I like that you recognize the tangential nature of the cut and or obliquely sectioned is another way to say. And that, you know, why? Because look, it was kind of like a slightly polypoid or stuck on lesion as poromas often are uh, kind of bulged up from the skin surface. And anytime you have a more polypoid lesion, it tends to be harder to get a perfect section at some point when we cut it in the lab. As you get towards the edges of the polyp, it's going to get tangential. So that's kind of true of any sort of polypoid thing. Um, poroma from low power 
you can see that the epidermis is dramatically expanded. You have these long fingers or tongues of, of bluish, uh, blue to pink cells extending down, like the reedy have gotten dramatically elongated and pushed down and kind of interconnected and anastomosed with one another. And, um, and there are multiple kind of areas like that. Some people I think have uh, likened this to like a shower curtain or something like that, or I, I can't remember the analogy, but I think it was something like that. Um, I guess so, if that works for you. Tongues, fingers, whatever. They, um, the other thing I like about them, the poroma cells are like just perfectly round little monotonous cells. Um, so people call that poroid. They usually do, even though they're very round, they usually do have pinkish cytoplasm, but it tends to be a less abundant, I think, than in like hydradenomas. Poroma and hydradenoma are part of, I believe, the acrospiroma family. They are very closely related, and just like you can see spiradenoma and cylindroma coexist, I often see tumors that look like poroma on the top, but then when you take the whole thing out, it looks like hydradenoma on the bottom. So actually, the times I encounter that, I'll often say poroma slash hydradenoma hybrid tumor. It doesn't matter. They're both benign sweat gland tumors. And of course, there are malignant forms of, of both poroma and hydradenoma, but much more rare. So the, um, the cells are very monotonous, and I love, if you guys have heard me talk before, I love when the cells are perfectly round. Glomus tumor, I really like seeing those because of that. Um, these are the duct spaces. You can have, just like in hydradenoma, um, poroma can have duct spaces that are very tiny and also big cystic ones, okay? I find that one problem I have is that poromas look a lot like seborrheic uh, keratosis sometimes, and I always am looking for zebra, so sometimes I'll be like, oh, I think it's a poroma especially in residency, I'd do this. And then it was just a seb. And also because sometimes I'll see spaces like this in a lesion and think, oh, is it going to be poroma? And then they're just like dilated, um, kind of uh, keratin filled spaces. So sometimes it's hard to know if it's a true duct space. If you really want, you could do an immunostain, although I don't think you really need this in real life very often. CEA tends to work really well. Carcinoembryonic antigen will like highlight the lining of the duct spaces. That's kind of my favorite stain, I think, to highlight ducts. The other thing is if you look closer, look, you can see actually like a layer of kind of cuboidal cells that have like a different kind of a more abundant pink cytoplasm lining the duct space here. So that's nice. Also, other times you'll find the little punched out lumens that have a little uh, cuticle around them. I'll find it in a minute. I saw it last, uh, when I was looking at these slides last night, but I can't remember where it went. Well, I don't know, but I'll, uh, I'll find it in a minute and I'll, I'll point it out if I see it. The, uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, another feature I really like for poroma is this. Look at where the edges, where the tumor interfaces with the epidermis, either kind of above it or to the sides of it. Look at that sharp cutoff. You could draw a line right here and say, this is the epidermis above it, and this is actually where the poroma starts. Is this very discrete, sharp cutoff. Similar to like the sharp cutoff we see in, you know, clear cell acanthoma, for example. So I find that to be a very, very useful diagnostic feature to see this, look again, this very sharp cutoff. That's incredibly characteristic of poroma. Here's a dilated duct space. Um, also, poromas tend to be inflamed. They tend to have edema and kind of loose edematous stroma uh, like this with big dilated blood vessels. They tend to be ulcerated a lot of times by the time you're biopsied. I feel like those, this one has an ulcer on top of it somewhere. If it'll load here. Oh, right there, yeah. See, it's ulcerated and has some granulation tissue. That's pretty typical. Poromas often have that. And because of that, they can sometimes get a little atypia. Um, usually, um, it's, if they're malignant, they usually are like floridly atypical, look, look a lot like Bowen's disease or squam in situ. And in fact, it can be hard to tell porocarcinoma, um, apart from, uh, Bowen's disease form of squam in situ, squam cell carcinoma in situ. All right. Well, I don't remember where the little tiny ducts were. And I guess, I guess it's not that important, uh, because all the other features here are very characteristic. So that is, oh, here, perfect. I just couldn't let it go. These are some little tiny duct lumens, and then these are the bigger, more cystic duct lumens. So that's a nice example of poroma. And I think I've pointed out to you guys, I don't usually get too hung up on eccrine this or apocrine that. I think there's an awful lot of overlap, and, and splitting between apocrine and eccrine just, uh, I don't know, just doesn't do it for me mentally. I just, I don't care, honestly. But some people, that really matters a lot, and that's fine. But I think in real life practice, practically, it's not important. So, okay, case five. This is not the best example in the world, but it'll do.
Yeah, hydradenoma papilla from. It is not the best example because it doesn't look that papillary, right? But you can tell we've got some apocrine glands down here. So we're probably, um, when you see apocrine glands, think of anogenital area, axilla, maybe near the nipple you can have them. Uh, you can also see apocrine glands in the eyelid, the glands of mole, but they don't. you don't see them in many other places. So in this case, we would be in the vulva, and this is a lesion made of multiple ducts and tubules closely packed together, and you, you will usually see um, papillary projections sticking into the lumen um, of this, and then they're lined by a double layer of kind of cuboidal to columnar line. Usually the outer layer is kind of cuboidal, and the inner layer is more columnar and tends to have these little apocrine snouts on it. So that like right there, you see the little snouts. So even without the papillae in the vulva, and it looks like this, hydradenoma papilliferum is perfect. And uh, to me, these, even though they have the name hydradenoma in them, they're, they're not like a variation of regular hydradenoma. They're a totally separate uh, tumor, I think. They, uh, they occur in different places. They look totally different. So uh, hydradenoma papilliferum. And if you see something like this on the nipple, uh, then it would be a nipple adenoma or erosive adenomatosis. I feel like nipple adenomas can look very similar, have a lot of overlapping features with hydradenoma papilliferum. All right. So again, not the most, uh, I guess here's a little area of a duct space that's got a couple papillae in it, but it's not, it's really not the most uh, dramatic example of, uh, of one, but it'll do. All right. Case six. What's this? Yeah, hydrosystoma. And this is really nice to see one completely punched out intact. Uh, we rarely get to see that because a lot of times they'll get shaved. And an uh, important point for, for practice is that oftentimes when I see them, I'll see like a shave and they'll want a bump near the eyelid or upper cheek. And then I won't see anything. And then I look or cut deeper levels. And then down at the base, I see like just a little sliver like of this. Like I'll just see a little layer right at the base of the shave with a double cuboidal lining. And I'm like, aha, we're at the top of a hydrosystoma. So uh, always think of that if, you, if you've got a little papule near the eyelid and you don't really see any good reason for it on your shave biopsy, cut some deeper levels and look carefully at the very bottom of the shave and sometimes you'll see the top of the hydrosystoma. Here we actually see the sweat secretion. This basically looks like a sweat duct that's just massively dilated, okay? and has a, a thin layer of cuboidal uh, lining, sometimes flat and sometimes with apocrine snout. So if you really want to say apocrine hydrosystoma or ecrine, cool, go for it. Uh, but I just say hydrosystoma. And if you see kind of papillary formations pushing in to the lumen, another thing you can think of is cyst adenoma, which is basically like I think of it like a hydrosystoma with a thickened, more complex lining. But one other thing to remember is near the eyelid, something that looks like hydrosystoma with, uh, with proliferation sticking into the lumen, you always have to think of endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. So if that setting, uh, I always, if I see like thickening or complexity of the lining of a hydrosystoma, I'll do neuroendocrine markers like synaptophysin or chromogranin, which is not as good, I think. Or my, my favorite now is INSM1, insulinoma-like uh, protein 1. INSM1 is a really nice neuroendocrine nuclear marker. And while we're here in the eyelid, let me point out that eyelid skin has a unique appearance. It, I feel like it often has pigment incontinence. I don't know exactly why. Maybe someone's published that and I just haven't seen that paper. But I noticed that a lot. It has a very loose kind of edematous uh, dermis. It's very pale. It tends to have pigment dropout. I kind of wonder if that has something to do with the dark circles that people get under their eyes sometimes. I, that's totally... Uh, theory that I, I have not in any way investigated, but I, it's made me wonder because I see it so often. And you will usually see, I can't remember if this one had it, the, the um, stromal cells in the dermis tend to be like kind of rounded nuclei and, and multinucleated, like two or three little nuclei clustered together. And I don't, I, I, again, I don't know why that is, but it's so distinct that usually you can see a biopsy and think, ooh, this is probably from the eyelid, just based on that. I guess it was another case in, in this set that had some of those multinucleated cells. But in any case, there's a hydrosystoma. Oh, and here's a lot of skeletal muscle down here, as we would expect near the eyelid. Okay, seven. What's this?
Any takers? Very good. Mixed tumor. Yes. And from low power, I would not in any way fault you for thinking that this is like a chondroma, a benign cartilage tumor of soft tissue, chondroma of soft parts. This is incredibly chondroid in this case, and thus the name chondroid syringoma is another name for cutaneous mixed tumor, although they don't, to me, usually look anything like a syringoma, and they don't always have chondroid. So sometimes they do this. Sometimes they have perfect, well-formed cartilage and even bone, like this one, very, very nice, like chondrocytes in lacunar spaces, right? But the reason we know it's not a chondroma, we know that it's actually a mixed tumor, is because it also has little tiny ducts and glands and tubules. So sometimes, again, I told you mixed tumor can have a wide range of features. It really does. This one is kind of the small tubule form. You have just these little tiny tubules with little lumens and they're tiny sweat ducts. And if you did a keratin stain, it would light these up, okay? And these are mixed tumors are mixed because they're a mixture of epithelial and myoepithelial cells. And the myoepithelial component can take a variety of forms, spindle, plasmacytoid, chondroid. They, my, I, my understanding is that the myoepithelial component is kind of largely responsible for generating the stromal parts of the tumor. And then the epithelial component makes the little ducts and tubules. But sometimes those ducts can be very focal and the tubules can be focal. And um, I've actually seen mixed tumors that had a bunch of like weird looking myoepithelial cells get misdiagnosed as melanoma and other things because the, they, the person overlooked the very focal ducts. And myoepithelial cells, an important take home is that they will co-express keratin and S100. So that's, and that's why I've, I've seen a case where you had big rhabdoid looking um, uh, myoepithelial cells and they were S100 positive and it got called a melanoma. Um, uh, incorrectly, unfortunately. It was a long, long time ago, but it was a very good learning case uh, that I saw uh, in training. So that's a good example of mixed tumor that's very chondroid and has very small um, kind of uh, subtle tubules. Okay, what's this? Case eight. Yeah, another hydradenoma, very good. And it's uh, you can add a, a lot of different adjectives to it if you want, like clear cell or nodular, nodular cystic, all those things work. And again, like I said earlier, acrospiroma is another name you can use for these. Um, I tend to call them hydradenoma. I feel like that nowadays uh, with the people I've worked with, I feel like that's a more well-known name. Um, uh, uh, like I mentioned with the earlier case, didn't show it, but these uh, often, I would say a significant subset of the cases I've seen connect right up to the epidermis and they can have a, a very similar look to poroma in that setting. Um, here's the duct spaces that are dilated. Uh, in this one, there's a little bit of papillary um, ingrowth and that's totally fine. And then also look at the nice dramatic clear cell change. And then the other cells are a very pink abundant cytoplasm, have a very keratinocyte squamoid appearance. Um, so very, very much they're a pink tumor, not a blue tumor usually. And uh, more duct spaces here and here, and then big dilated cystic duct spaces. And these are the areas where you start seeing all of this clear cell change. You know, you, if you're having a bad day, you could think, oh, that might be a renal cell. Not in this case, I mean, because here, yes, that's clear cell, but the rest of it definitely looks like hydradenoma. So an important thing to know about, but in real life, it only rarely have I seen cases that really mimicked renal cell um, in any significant way. And then here's the dense basement membrane material, again, that um, collagen type 4 that you often find in the background. Case 9. Yeah, another mixed tumor that looks totally different from the one we looked at earlier. See, like I told you, the wide range of features that mixed tumors tend to have. This one does have, let me see if I can get a less smudgy area. This one does have chondroid background, but it's not like really well-formed cartilage, right? It's kind of chondromixoid. So I like the chondromixoid concept because chondroid and mixoid, um, both of which have bluish ground substance in the background, have a very close overlap. So I feel like sometimes it's hard to tell apart chondroid and mixoid because they kind of can coexist. And because of that, it's not a bad idea that if you think something looks kind of like cartilage, keep mixoid tumors in your mind too. If you think something looks mixoid, always remember that chondroid tumors can kind of mimic mixoid sometimes. 
So um, here they don't have as those well-formed lacunar spaces like we had earlier, but it does have that bluish kind of uh, more dense look like uh, cartilage. And then the um, in this one, the stromal component is really kind of uh, takes a back seat. And the main component here is the dramatic overgrowth of the epithelial component, which in this case has anastomosing interconnected ducts and tubules lined by double layer cuboidal to columnar cells, sometimes with apocrine snouting. Sometimes you can get little papillary ingrowths. Look, that's a nice example of the double layer, right? It's recapitulating what we see like in a sweat duct, okay? And here there's a little bit of apocrine snouting right there. So that's a very nice example. I've even seen, oh, and then here also, look, you can have cystic areas that have kind of a more thin attenuated lining. I've also seen even uh, sometimes keratin cysts and hair follicle differentiation in mixed tumors. And that's not totally surprising because if you think about it embryologically, my, I'm not a, an expert in embryology, but from my very basic understanding, the um, apocrine glands and sebaceous glands come from the same thing as the hair follicle, right? They come from the kind of the pilosebaceous unit embryologically, whereas eccrine glands and ducts originate separately. So there probably really is a difference between eccrine tumors and apocrine tumors, with apocrine ones being more um, able to overlap with sebaceous and follicular differentiation. But again, in real life, I don't really focus on sorting that out, but I do think probably biologically there really are two different kind of groups. I just think it's hard to tell. But the reason I point that out is sometimes you'll see tumors that kind of defy the rules and you'll see a thing that has sweat ducts but also has obvious hair follicle differentiation. And how do you make sense of that? Well, I think that's an explanation for how that, you know, the stem cells that give rise to the, the pilosebaceous uh, unit and the apocrine glands can give rise to tumors that have overlapping features between those. So don't be disconcerted um, or alarmed if you see tumors that kind of break the rules and have overlap between those because that happens sometimes and definitely a mixed tumor I've seen that one. So very nice example of a, a mixed tumor. Case 10. Oh, I guess I should show you the tumor. Well, where where are we here? What kind of specimen is this? Yeah, this is acral skin. And look at the shape of it. How did they get this like, is this a polyp? What's going on here? What's this? Very good. This is the nail matrix. So we're getting a, this is not a small biopsy. This is a fingertip basically, or a thumb tip or a toe tip. I don't know the history of this case, but yeah, this is the, this is the proximal nail fold. And then here's where it curves under and goes down. And then this little uh, jagged area here is the nail matrix that will stop and admire for a minute. The beauty of this normal histology, because we rarely, thankfully rarely get to see full nice orientation of this kind of specimen. Um, so there's the nail matrix, and then from that, we can see the keratinocytes develop into a thickened, compact layer of keratin, kind of resembling stratum corneum, but more dense, that sticks to the underlying epithelium, which the matrix transitions into nail bed epithelium at some point in here. And then this is the nail plate on here, the part that, for any of you who are beginners out there watching this online, the nail plate is the part that, that grows and that we clip at the ends, um, or that we paint, um, if, if you're into that. So that's the nail plate, and then the part that generates the plate is this modified keratinocyte layer, the, the matrix down here. And then the dermis underneath, some people have called this the onychodermis, the dermis underneath the nail bed is kind of specialized. It looks different than regular dermis. It has like a different kind of texture to the collagen. Um, so all of those things are, are good to know about. I am by no means a nail expert. I still find nail pathology incredibly challenging, um, and I defer to experts like... Uh, uh, Beth Rubin and Adam Rubin, no relation, but both of them are awesome dermpaths who like nails. So, and then also over here, the other thing is nail bed epithelium. This is not normal because because it's distorted. It, look, look how tangential that cut is. See all those islands of papillary dermis? That's we're cutting totally across at a very oblique angle. That's why it looks so wild here. We're seeing all the interconnections of the reedy. But what I did want to point out is that unlike in regular skin where the reedy have kind of the little test tube shape, in the nail bed epithelium, they have these very jagged kind of uh, bases. So if you see something that looks like epithelium, like looks like skin surface or epidermis, but has very jagged reedy, you should think about, oh, maybe we're underneath the nail. Like if you've been, if it's quiz and no one's told you where it's from, something like that. So this is not perfect because it's a very distorted angle. All right, finally, I'll, and one last normal, I have to, I'm sorry. Look at these. 
what is this structure and why is it the most beautiful normal structure in the human body? Yeah, the chinian corpuscles, I love them. They're my very favorites. Oh, swoon. I just can't get enough. I, I never stop taking pictures of them. So they're beautiful little spongy onion things, and they've got a little nerve in the middle, and they're for vibration and deep pressure receptor. Um, and maybe maybe there's Meissner's here. Let me see, because I've already gone way down the rabbit hole, so let's keep going. Why not? This is why I finish late every week, guys. I'm sorry. Look at that. That's a Meissner's right there. I wish it was a little clearer, but it's a, it's in the papillary dermis, and it's like a little pink egg with little stripes. I think it's like a little Easter egg with stripes on it. Someone else told me once a cotton candy swirled on a stick. I like that, too. That's pretty good. So um, and these, because they're close to the surface, these are for fine touch receptor, right? So that's a, a Meissner's. Oh, and there's more. Look at that. You see Meissner's mostly on the uh, volar surfaces of the, the fingers and toes. Um, occasionally see them on like the glands penis. Um, and then also the um, pachinian are usually on a, a volar surface of hands and feet, but also you can see them in weird places like, like the pancreas, for example. I don't know why, but that's, that's, what, that's what happens. Okay, so here's the tumor now, finally. Sorry about that. I just had to, I had to do it. We, we got this blue kind of basaloid looking tumor very ulcerated. Probably that ulcer was a biopsy site because usually you're not going to amputate the end of a digit without a biopsy proven diagnosis of something bad, right? So you can cheat on this case and know it's got to be cancer or else someone really messed up, right? So what is it? Yeah, this probably is a papillary digital adenocarcinoma. It used to be called aggressive papillary digital adenocarcinoma. There's been a recent trend to get away from that because it's not I mean, it is cancer, but it's not like more aggressive than, I mean, it has a, I don't know, 20 some percent chance of metastases, but it's, it's not like, you know, 90% of people die from it or something like that. So some people have challenged and said we should drop the aggressive from the name, uh, even though historically we've done that. This one I think is not the most characteristic example, but um, it does have these solid sheets of, of cells and then those are punctuated by little tubules. So I am very, anytime I see any sweat gland tumor in the, palms or soles, particularly on the fingers or toes, I always think about, could it be papillary digital adenocarcinoma? Because these tumors are sometimes very challenging to diagnose. They can be very bland. They often do not have much cytologic atypia. They can, but I've seen multiple examples that were very, very bland. And then um, they can have a variety of different patterns. Sometimes they don't, they have a more solid pattern like this where you don't see good papillae. So I want to say I found like a little bit of papillary... Probably this was a little bit of papillary structures infolding into a cystic space, but it's all been distorted by the biopsy site. So just keep in mind that this entity, and if you have any doubt, get an expert consult or get help because a lot rides on this and, and it's going to get a pretty aggressive surgical treatment and sometimes we'll end up with a digit or a ray amputation even. So it's a pretty serious diagnosis to make. You don't want to miss it, but you definitely don't want to overcall it. Um, I would say most of the ones I've seen have been deeper down, like almost down to the, the subcutis near like the tendon uh, or fascia like or the tendon sheath. Um, but I have seen a few that were up in the dermis like this. Um, but I think most of the time they're deeper down um, in my experience at least. All right, if you're watching this at home, uh, I'll put a link to another case that is a really good example down in the comments or in the, the video description below. Okay, this is case 11. Yeah, clear cell acanthoma, even from low power, even when it's not in focus yet, you can tell it's acanthotic epidermis. Not really clear usually, but more pale. Some people like to call it pale cell acanthoma. Um, because the cytoplasm is kind of a pale pink and also there's a spongiosis in between usually. So it's a mixture of pale cytoplasm plus inter, uh, uh, intercellular edema between the cells or spongiosis. And like I said earlier, it has a very discrete sharp cutoff with the adjacent epidermis. And sometimes you can see a few foci of it. You can see like a focus and then normal epidermis and then another focus. So I've seen ones like that where they're kind of multifocal. Over top, the granular layer is usually gone and it's uh, there's a lining of parakeratosis. And oftentimes you'll see neutrophils in the epidermis and in the stratum corneum, kind of like psoriasis a little bit. And these tend to be kind of red um, uh, papules or small plaques um, on the, uh, I feel like I see them most often on the leg, but I've seen them at a variety of sites 
I think the most recent one I saw was like on the neck or somewhere strange. So uh, they can they can kind of occur anywhere, but I think leg seems to be the most most common type or place for them. Okay, twelve. Where are we at here? No skin. This looks to me like dense and wavy, a little bit like ramen noodle. So I kind of wonder, is this like fascia, tendon sheet, something like that? I mean, it could also be scar, but it seems so regular that I think it, we must be down deep near the fascia at this point. And then we've got spaces. Yeah, very good. So when you're down in deep soft tissue and you see gland spaces or cystic spaces that are lined by a layer of epithelial cells, well, one thing you have to think of is could it be metastatic carcinoma, right? Because you shouldn't have glands down in deep soft tissue. But the one really important mimic to not miss is endometriosis, which can, if you're having a bad day, can get mistaken for metastatic carcinoma potentially. But the key is that not only do we see these kind of uh, glands lined by double layer of cuboidal columnar type cells, a lot of times, or I, maybe it's not always double, I can't remember. And the, the layer, the feature of the cells can range a little bit. And I think that has uh, oftentimes has something to do with the, the where at in the menstrual cycle the woman is, because just like endometrium in the uterus changes with the different levels of hormones throughout the, uh, the cycle, the same thing happens with the endometrial glands in endometriosis. So here are the glands, but the other things that you should look for is the stroma, this kind of cellular spindled to round cell stroma and hemorrhage. So you usually will have glands plus stroma plus blood and hemosiderin plus a lot of scarring in the background, okay? And here you can get like kind of necrotic debris even in the middle of these lumens. So, you know, again, if you're having a bad day, you can start thinking of colon cancer, things like that, and you don't want to make that mistake. Usually when I see these there in the abdominal wall in the scar from a C-section, but you can also see them like in the vulva and in other places as well. And when patients have, uh, I think, are on progesterone, they can get decidualization, which can make the stroma and the lining cells look very weird and strange and very atypical. Um, uh, I've only seen, rarely uh, seen very dramatic cases of that, but it can, I've seen examples in study sets that were pretty scary looking. So um, important to remember, remember that. Okay. What's this? Good. There is basal cell. They're very nice. So that's a clue that we're probably dealing with a re-excision. And then what's that mean? This is in the middle. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. So this is a biopsy site in the middle. So sometimes if you're not given the history, it can be challenging and you could get really concerned about these islands of epithelial cells here. In this case, we've got residual basal cell, which tells us, oh, this must be a re-excision of a biopsy site. The other thing we can look for is those little histiocytes that have the bluish gray cytoplasm that are filled with aluminum chloride. I don't know if we have them in this case. And that only works if the previous biopsy was uh, had aluminum chloride applied afterwards. But when you see that, that can help. Here we got granulation tissue um, with reactive blood vessels and a lot of neutrophils. And then here we have this proliferation of um, little squamous looking islands, some of which have little tiny distorted sweat duct lumens in the middle. And so this is a mixture of basically um, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia of the epidermis, reactive epidermal change, and reactive sweat ducts, which are called uh, squamous syringometaplasia. This is not the most perfect example I've seen, but I think it's really, really important because occasionally, um, if, especially if you don't know the history, or if the patient had a history of squamous cell carcinoma, and now you're seeing a, a, a re-biopsy from the, the scar where they're wondering, is this inflamed scar or recurrence of cancer? It can become a problem where you really worry, are these reactive or are these cancer? So it's really important to study biopsy site reactive changes whenever you get a chance to, because that will help you 
uh, when you have a challenging case. And I've seen times where people really struggled and, and uh, misinterpreted this as being cancer when it's actually just a benign reactive change. So uh, this is a good example. This kind of jagged edges of the reedy uh, pushing down into the granulation tissue in the dermis. I find that really helpful for reactive. See how, how jagged and kind of distorted this gets. And look, you can even see here, it's out of focus, but it actually helps us because we can see the fibers. Look at the elastic fibers. Reactive, pseudoepitheliominous hyperplasia. The epidermis loves to kind of grab and wrap around elastic fibers in the dermis. Um, Keratoid canthomas do that also, by the way, but obviously this doesn't at all look like keratoid canthoma um, architecturally. So good example of reactive epidermal changes and squamous syringometaplasia at a biopsy site. Don't mistake it for cancer here. Again, this jagged epidermal change. So yes, if you're watching this at home, study biopsy site changes, especially when you know it's not squame. Like if it's a melanoma excision, that's a perfect time. Go look at how weird the epidermis looks and how atypical the reactive regrowing keratinocytes can look and how weird the sweat ducts. See the duct lumens there? That's how you know this is syringometaplasia. You find the duct lumens. And oftentimes you can see it kind of transition down into more obvious ducts down below. See, it's just starting here. And then the closer we get up to where the cut was made with biopsy, the more weird and bizarre the, these kind of little acrosyringeal structures get. So anyway, study it when you know that it's not a squame, and then it'll help you when you see this and look, there's a mite, a mitosis. Oh my gosh, no, it's fine. It's benign. So I still, I find reactive versus neoplastic to be a challenge sometimes in practice, even after almost a decade of doing this. And so uh, I think you can never study it too much because sometimes it will really save you um, being very good at that and having a lot of experience with looking at reactive versus neoplasm. 14. This is an awesome example. Yeah, very good. This is erosive adenomatosis of the nipple or nipple adenoma, same thing. And this is great because I, I don't know if I've ever seen such a perfect sized example. I mean, it, it looks like, unfortunately, the whole nipple was removed, but I wonder if maybe this was an incidental finding like in a, in a breast cancer. I don't know anything about the history of this case, but usually I get a small biopsy and I can't see the base. So we can tell we're on the nipple though here because look what we have down here. This is breast tissue these little tiny clusters of asini, and then these ducts. So these are the, the, the lobules and then the ducts of the breast. The, the ducts look a little bit like sweat um, ducts, uh, but they have kind of a more columnar lining usually. That's my simplified way of uh, explaining. And remember, because breast is kind of like modified sweat gland, uh, basically, right? So they have a lot of overlap. Here's some cystic dilation of the duct, probably because it's being, or we could, I don't know, maybe it's part of like um, fibrocystic changes of the breast, I'm not sure. Um, what the again what the history was so as we go further up here look what we see here in the dermis we see a thing that looks like a breast duct these are lactiferous ductules or nipple ducts and then there's lots of smooth muscle in the background so a lot of times you're not going to see breast tissue so you're going to have to recognize these structures and know oh that means we're on or near nipple or maybe if we're not on the nipple that it's an accessory nipple and then there's lots of smooth muscle bundles and finally here's the tumor and it's made of um, multiple ducts and tubules packed closely together, many of which have complex kind of papillary uh, structures that grow into the lumen and then fuse together. And so it makes this kind of a complex, almost very interconnected anastomotic papillary structures in the lumen that, that fuse together. And you can see a nice layer of myoepithelial or basal cells around the outside, and then the inner apical cells, which are larger and have larger nuclei. So you often see kind of apocrine snout looking structures in here. And um, this, uh, if you're a pathologist, I think there's a lot of overlap microscopically. And I'm not a breast uh, pathologist by any means, but I think to my eye, these have a lot of overlap with usual ductal hyperplasia of the breast, UDH, or of uh, ductal papilloma of the breast. So honestly, when I get these in practice, I usually, I, I don't see them very often, if I see a biopsy where I can't see the whole thing, like here you can tell this is obviously limited to the dermis in the nipple. This is definitely a nipple papilloma and is benign. When we see a partial biopsy, there's always the possibility that maybe it is actually a ductal papilloma deeper down in the nipple duct and that it's just pushing up and getting superficially sampled. And usually my understanding is that duct, uh, papillomas, ductal papilloma in the breast usually get completely removed because occasionally they can have cancer arise in them. So again, I, I don't know a lot about breast pathology, but I 
in that setting, I usually do recommend that the dermatologist consult with a breast surgeon just to make sure they've done an exam to see if they think that there's anything deeper or if it really is limited to the skin so that they can decide how to best uh, manage the case. So this is really a, a just a perfect uh, textbook example, I think, of a nipple papilloma. And they often ulcerate, and that's why they get called erosive adenomatosis as their other name. And this is another classic perfect one. What's this? So yes, this is a perfect steatocystoma. We've got cystic spaces with stratified squamous lining, but then we've got that jagged bright pink or red kind of refractile cuticle and the sawtooth shape of the lining. And that alone is enough to make the diagnosis. But when you're really lucky, you'll actually see sebaceous glands coming right in and draining into the cyst. So this is recapitulating the um, uh, sebaceous duct part of the hair follicle, which has that same bright pink lining. So really nice. So this is a true sebaceous cyst, if you like, but steatocystoma. Another textbook example. What's this one? Yeah, pilomatricoma or pilomatrixoma, whichever you like. I like how the X looks, but I like, it's easier to say pilomatricoma. And it's a mixture of these ghost cells or shadow cells, which are just the washed out sheets of dead keratinocytes. The that's dead keratin incites a massive granulomatous reaction with giant cells and histiocytes, which are usually present. And, um, and then if you are lucky, you'll see um, islands of blue basaloid cells. These can be totally absent or they can be abundant. It just depends on the case. And um, the basaloid cells can be very mitotically active. I can't get the focus to show you here, but they have lots of mitoses, florid mitoses. Do not be afraid. That is okay. Unless I see like dra dramatic pleomorphism or a lot of like atypical mitotic figures, then I'm going to start getting worried. Usually the times I've seen malignant pilomatricomas or matrical carcinomas have been in adults and they've looked instantly like malignancy when I look at it. And then only later as I look around, do I find some areas that have like some matrical differentiation. So most of the time, if I look at something and I think this looks like a pilomatricoma, almost always it ends up being a benign pilomatricoma. I have seen like one exception I can think of that was a massive tumor that grew really rapidly and uh, looked just like pilomatricoma up close, but it had islands of tumor growing way out into the soft tissue away from the main mass and was clearly behaving in a malignant manner clinically. So that I would say is a very rare uh, exception. So normally once you say pilomatricoma, it's almost always going to end up being benign. So that's just been my experience. Um, but uh, otherwise people will send these in and consult because they're like, I see, you know, 20 mitoses in this field. Yeah, it happens. These are, are dividing cells. They're recapitulating the germinative uh, matrix of the hair follicle, which is its job is to grow and reproduce and divide and form a hair shaft, right? And this is basically, instead of forming hair shaft, this tumor makes these sheets of ghost cells. So it's trying to make hair, but instead it makes these sheets of ghost or shadow cells. And um, oh, the other thing is they can have actual um, necrosis of the oh here you can also see sometimes the transition see how you transition from the blue matrical cells and then they get kind of pale then the nuclei get kind of uh, pycnotic and, and shrunken and dark almost dark black almost looking and then the nuclei disappear and you transition out into the dead sheets of shadow or ghost cells so that's exactly how the process happens and then uh, this one had also I think a nice little focus of yeah, the blue basaloid cells can actually have individual single cell necrosis sometimes. Don't be worried. That to me, I think that's normal to see. And I've seen times on like a needle biopsy on cytology where this blue cells, a lot of mitoses and necrosis uh, gets people concerned for malignancy. But in the setting of pilomatricoma, in my opinion and experience, this is a normal, common, benign finding. And they're most common in kids, but I've seen them even in older adults. And I've seen uh, relatively large examples that ended up behaving in a benign fashion. So this is perfect because it's shelled out. A lot of times you just get a fragment of this, um, but that's a good example. 17. Relatively rare bird here. What is it? I'll accept two different answers because I think they're both the same thing in my opinion.
Yeah, papillary eccrine adenoma or tubular apocrine adenoma. Uh, people split these out, but I still do not know reliably how to tell them apart. I'll tell you the honest truth. I see things like this is labeled, I believe, as a tubular apocrine adenoma, but it also has a lot of little papillae in it, right, that look a lot like papillary eccrine adenoma. So I don't know if, I, I think that these things probably exist on a spectrum. They're so rare, and I've only seen a small handful of them. So maybe I'm not the most expert person on this in the world. So maybe someone who's seen more of them knows. In any case, they're both uh, benign uh, sweat gland and sweat duct uh, proliferations. They um, tend to have a lining that has little papillary or micropapillary structures in it. Um, like you can see here, these little tiny fingers and islands of floating tumor cells. They can have some debris. It look, looks almost like necrosis, but I think it's just debris from broken down um, sweat duct cells in the lumens. You can have calcifications with it, like we saw up here. And, um, and then some of the cells will have apocrine kind of snouting. So I guess if you see apocrine snouting, then you can say, oh, okay, it's a tubular apocrine adenoma. But I don't, for a test, I guess that's what I would tell you to do is if you see apocrine snouts, then call it a tubular apocrine adenoma. But I, I think it would honestly be pretty unfair to have, that, have you distinguish between those. So if someone out there knows how to tell these apart with uh, reliably, please uh, leave a comment in the, down below the video and educate me. But otherwise, I think that they're kind of on a spectrum. So the important thing to note, though, about this is most of the sweat gland tumors we've looked at today are nodules that are sharply circumscribed, right? This is a tumor, though, that especially if you get a biopsy in the middle, it has multiple tubules kind of centered in, or sitting in the dermis apart from each other. Because of that, it can give kind of the impression of in an infiltrative growth pattern, which is a feature in sweat gland tumors. We worry if we see infiltrative growth or if we see obvious like cytologic malignancy. So, um, but usually if you have a thing completely excised, you can tell that even though the tubules look like they're infiltrating or invading the dermis, they're actually a circumscribed collection if you see the whole lesion from low power, right? You can draw kind of a circle around the whole thing. So I think that's the, the, the harder part is if you only get a partial biopsy of one of these, um, you could struggle uh, with knowing uh, what it was. And do use caution if you see something like this on an acral surface because, you know, with the papillary structures, I have occasionally seen um, cases of digital papillary adenocarcinoma that had some overlapping features with this. So I would, would use caution um, when you see something like this in, a, in an acral location. And I would ideally want to see the whole lesion in that case. All right, so that's a pretty good example of a rare entity. All right, 18. What is this? Yeah, this is spiradenoma, blue balls in the dermis, right? Nice, sharply circumscribed nodules made of blue cells. The cells look very similar to those of cylindroma. Spiradenomas, though, tend to have a scattering of lymphocytes. Unfortunately, this scan um, is not very good at high power and doesn't. it's kind of a hazy for some reason. But usually you'll see kind of the two different types of smaller, darker cells and then the bigger, lighter cells, plus a scattering of lymphocytes. Here's sweat ducts, these little holes and tubules, but they can sometimes be very focal. And again, this can have a lot of overlap with um, cylindroma. Um, and so when you see a nodule where all of the nests are all making a big kind of sheet into a big nodule, then that spiradenoma, when you see actual discrete nests that are like molding together like the giraffe spots or the puzzle pieces, then that's cylindroma. But the distinction is of no importance. They are both basically two ends of a spectrum, if you ask me. The other thing I will point out is that sometimes you can get abundant edema in the background of spiradenoma, and so it can give you this very stringy, um, elongated strands of tumor floating in kind of mixoid background. And if you have just a chunk of this, it can look really weird and not make you think of spiradenoma at first because you're usually used to seeing a big blue solid nodule. But just know that this is a common finding to have a lot of edema. And if, if it's really dramatic or you only have a partial biopsy, um, sometimes that can be a confusing feature. If you just got a fragment of this, you know, for example, it might be a little harder to sort out. But usually when you have the whole thing, you can see some other areas that look more more classic for spiradenoma. Nineteen. What 
what's this? Yeah, this is a beautiful syringocystadenoma, uh, papilliferum or scap, and it has invaginated um, channels, um, sweat ducts that open up to the surface, and these kind of make it kind of branching frond-like anastomosing channels as they go down into the dermis, and then transition sometimes to small tubules at the bottom, and they're lined by double layer cuboidal epithelium. They often have apocrine snouts on them. Can't really appreciate that here. And then in the stroma, the, the stroma gets kind of left in between these ducts and makes papillary structures, okay? So the, as, the, as the ducts go down and fuse together, it leaves papillary um, structures that are lined by double layer cuboidal epithelium. And usually there's a bunch of plasma cells. This one doesn't have that many. Right? There's some right there, but it's still not a ton. But usually a lot of plasma cells around this for some reason. And most commonly these occur on the scalp in the setting of nevus sebaceus. And even though we don't see great features here, uh, per the, the um, study set guide, this is actually arising in a nevus sebaceus. So. Okay, 20, what's this? Good, syringoma. And so it's made of little ducts and tubules very obvious gland spaces, right? Like you can see almost every single one. These are cut a little tangential, so you just see kind of the tadpole shape. But usually it is not hard at all to find duct spaces in these, right? Each each individual island has a duct in the middle. They're lined by a, a nice thick pink cuticle. They often have little dried up sweat secretion kind of congealed in the middle there. Sometimes they look round like a little circle or a donut. Other times they have the little tadpole shape with the tail. And look at the difference here from low power. This is eyelid skin, right? See, I told you it's very loose and edematous eyelid skin. And then here, all of a sudden, you have this very, very dense sclerotic pink collagen in the background. And all of the little ducts and tubules of the syringoma are embedded in that, in their own discrete um, sclerotic stroma. I find that a really helpful feature for syringoma. They almost always have this dense pink stroma there, and they're kind of stuck in the middle of that stroma. And it's kind of different and discrete from the surrounding dermis. And I think this actually, I was telling you earlier that one of these had, yeah, look. So eyelid skin usually has a skeletal muscle if you go deep enough. It has a demitus dermis, usually has melanin, pigment, and continence, and it tends to have these multinucleated, almost like florette looking cells which I think are probably like some sort of fibroblast. Maybe they're histiocytes, I don't know. But they're a common, common enough finding that if you see skin like this, right away I'm going to think, oh, this may be from the eyelid. Okay. And this is a good um, syringoma. And it does have, like you pointed out, the, the clear glycogen-filled cells. And supposedly these have an association with diabetes, the clear cell form of syringoma. 21. Wow, great example of something rare. What is this? Yeah, this is a true adenoid cystic carcinoma. Um, these are uh, salivary gland tumors that often arise in the parotid. And in that site, they can be aggressive and invade like the facial nerve and really um, uh, be a real problem for the patient. They can occasionally metastasize. So if you see, and these are rare enough that if you see one in skin, it's probably good to check the history and probably get an, at least a at least a palpation exam, maybe even a scan, just to make sure that they don't have um, an occult primary in the salivary gland. Um, I think that's a reasonable approach just to make sure you're not dealing with a metastasis. But if you've excluded that, um, we do know that primary cutaneous examples exist. I've published a case report on this a long time ago. I'm still waiting for the Nobel uh, committee to call me about that. But in any case, I will put a link to that down below if you're really curious um, to, to read it. But uh, this is what we see as blue basaloid cells. So one thing this could get confused with is basal cell carcinoma, which we know can have adenoid um, change or, or blue mucin filled spaces. But in adenoid basal, the blue spaces are very irregular in size and kind of loosely organized. Um, and you'll have other areas that look like classic basal. In adenoid cystic, to me, this is a very characteristic uh, look that the, the spaces are very sharply punched out, very sharply circumscribed. I mean, they do vary in size a little bit, but you can see how very perfectly round um, they are. And if I can find an area, let's see, another difference from uh, from basal cell carcinoma is this, that the blue spaces, they, they almost have like a little thin pink layer, like a cuticle, a little thin lining 
of dense pink around, and that's what gives them, I think, this very sharp, punched out look. And then they've got mucin in the middle. And in basal cell, that's just basically mucin, like pulling apart the tumor and making these kind of pools. So that's this very discreet little layer of pink there with the mucin in the middle. Um, helps. And then also, again, if you look around, you're not going to see the other things that we'd see in basal cell, like the nice basal palisading, the mucin filled clefts and stuff like that. Also, these tumors stain with SOX10. And I think another um, stain called MYB, M-Y-B, um, stains these. I, I don't have much experience with salivary gland pathology, and I've only seen a handful of these in practice, but I believe that's another stain that can be used. So there are some stains that can be done to help confirm the diagnosis if needed. Um, I think SOX10 is readily available and tends to stain the vast majority of these, whereas it should be negative in a basal cell carcinoma. So a really rare bird. And based on what I read about this when we did our case report, in the skin, I mean, these need to be completely excised, but they have a pretty good prognosis and usually are indolent and not as aggressive and problematic as they are in the salivary gland. I, I suspect that's because in the salivary gland, they're really you know, close access to big nerves. And in the skin, they're, you know, they're way up away from the big, deep nerves. So I, I don't know for sure, but I, I wonder if maybe that plays some role in it just based on location. But really good example. I mean, this is really, I think this is probably the nicest one that I've uh, seen actually in the skin, the nicest, most classic example. So that's what you need to remember in your mind. That is true adenoid cystic carcinoma. All right. 22. <laughs> Accessory nipple, yes. And it looks kind of like Seb on the top, papillomatous acanthotic epidermis and smooth muscle bundles, more than there should be in the normal dermis. And if you're really lucky, you'll find down here a nipple duct. And look also apocrine glands because you tend to have apocrine glands around the nipple so you can have them in accessory nipple too and again look at the see it's kind of a more columnar lining and kind of more shaggy or something on the surface that's like the the nipple duct lining has that look as opposed to say a sweat duct which is a little bit more like kind of clean and not not as columnar and not as shaggy on the surface it's a more like kind of tight layer uh, i don't know if i'm describing that right but i do feel like there's a and these are darker blue usually. So sometimes I think it's um, hard maybe to, at first to recognize how do we know that's a nipple duct, but it looks different. And if you study and compare, this is a nice slide because you can contrast apocrine, eccrine, and nipple duct. All right. And sometimes also you'll see in large sebaceous glands up here, which are kind of corresponding to the Montgomery tubercles, uh, the large sebaceous glands that you see around the normal nipple, accessory nipple, or supernumerary nipple, if you like. 23. It's kind of a tricky one. This is what we got up here, and then here's what we got down here. And this is probably on the face. What is it? Yeah, this is microcystic adnexal carcinoma, very rare tumor, locally aggressive, usually occurs on the face. Usually they have keratin filled cysts at the top. This one's a little unusual because it has kind of solid nodules and islands, so they can have a range of features, but very bland. Look at this. This doesn't look like cancer cytologically. I mean, those cells don't look ugly at all. And you can see even nice duct spaces here. But a lot of times, in my experience, up at the surface of the lesion, they don't have many duct spaces at all. It's really hard to see the ducts. They're kind of very compressed. But when you go down deeper, I feel like I, you often see them better. But, you know, they do run a range of different features. But here, look, each one of these looks more or less like a normal sweat duct. But there's way too many of them. And they're infiltrating down into, look, there's normal appearing, cytologically normal appearing sweat ducts. But they're infiltrating down into the skeletal muscle way down deep. So a lot of times to make this diagnosis with certainty, I really need to see a, a deep, full thickness biopsy. I feel like it's a very hard, if not impossible, diagnosis to make on a shave because they can very closely resemble desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. This one doesn't because it has obvious ducts, but a lot of times the, um, the, they can have areas that look, to my eye, identical to desmoplastic trichoep. So usually I want to see a deeper deeper biopsy and seeing them invade down to the subcutis and the skeletal muscle 
is the most helpful thing. They often have perineural invasion, but desmoplastic trichoeps can sometimes involve nerves also and still have an indolent course, which sounds crazy, but it's been nicely, nicely written about by the Yale uh, group. And um, I've actually seen cases of it in practice too um, that had a good outcome as far as I'm aware. But so this is those MAC and uh, pretty rare. I only see these maybe every few years, uh, but unfortunately a locally aggressive tumor. I did pull up another example to show you here. This is probably the best one I've ever seen. And this one's good because um, I'll put a link for this in the video description if you're watching this online. Ah, see there, keratin filled cyst, little micro cyst filled with keratin. And then little ducts and tubules down here that are infiltrating. See, they're everywhere. These ones have like multiple little, little uh, duct linings or duct lumens, excuse me. And they're infiltrating way down deep, way into the skeletal muscle. And somewhere in here is perineural invasion, but I'll have to, I have to look and find it later. You can go check out the slide and find it, but it's, I'm pretty sure there's a good area of perineural in this case, if I recall. But that's a pretty good example. Like on a shave biopsy, that'd be impossible to diagnose. In this case, very, very difficult. All right, Mac. Very good, glomangioma and glomus tumor, which closely related and overlapping, but when there's lots of big dilated spaces, I tend to call glomangioma, and they're composed of very uniform round blue nuclei, sometimes with some pink cytoplasm, um, usually with some pink cytoplasm. The, um, because of that, they can sometimes mimic sweat gland tumors. I've seen cases that were more solid and looked a lot like uh, hydradenoma, or um, uh, and closely mimic that because they can sometimes have pale um, or even clear cell cytoplasmic change. So the, um, the cells wrap around the vessels, and I really like this one because you can see nicely, look at this, as these va vascular channels go out away from the main lesion, the little layer of glomus cells continues to track right along them. Because remember, these are modified pericytes, which are basically the type of smooth muscle cells that line small vessels. And so that's what the, these are. The other thing is usually each individual cell is very discreet because they're, if you do like a PAS stain or a collagen type 4 stain, you don't need to, but it's pretty if you want to do one for education. Usually individual cells are aligned and wrapped by a layer of basement membrane. And so it gives each cell kind of a very discreet look um, uh, that's distinct from its neighbors. So that's glomus. And these will stain with, um, the cells themselves will stain with smooth muscle actin. Although I find it's usually kind of patchy, not every cell, not, not like diffuse strong staining. They're desmin negative and they're negative for vascular markers. A lot of times people get this confused and they think it's a vascular tumor. It's not. It's a modified muscle tumor, a pericyte tumor, not an endothelial tumor. So it should be negative for CD31, ERG, and usually negative for CD34 as well. You'll just see the, the endothelial lining of the lumens um, positive. And these are most common under the nail bed, but you can see them at pretty much any site. They can occur lots of different places. What's this? Yeah, this is Paget's disease. This was from the vulva, I think, so extra mammary Pagets. And here you can see all these atypical cells with pagetoid spread. And you can obviously see on H&E the blue mucin, um, uh, the mucus that the cells are producing. And it's giving the cells like a signet ring appearance. Um, sometimes it's much more subtle and you really need to do um, stains. You can do mucin stains, although I, I like to do a cytokeratin 7 is my favorite stain. It's not, not all of them stain with it, but, uh, but I feel like overall it's the stain that tends to work best. If it's negative, then you can do some other markers. Um, and of course, remember that uh, melanoma can have pagetoid spread and so can squam in situ, as well as a few other things like sebaceous carcinomas. Um, but uh, in this setting, uh, in the genitals or in the nipple, and you see this, it's it's pagets until proven otherwise, okay? And then you can do the stains to prove it. And this one's kind of weird because I don't know what's going on with the epidermis here. 
I, it looks almost like basal cell carcinoma or something. I kind of wonder if this is a weird form of epidermal induction. I, again, I don't know the history of this case because it's from Dr. Ferringer's study set, but it, it reminds me of the basaloid induction you can see like over top of a dermatofibroma. And we can sometimes see that in association with other tumors. And I wonder if that's what's going on here, like a strange um, basaloid epidermal induction, like hair follicle type epidermal um, changes. Um, related to the tumor. I don't think I've ever seen that before in pageants. It's kind of an interesting case. And here, sometimes they make like little clusters and almost start to make little ducts or, or glands uh, in the epidermis. So Paget's disease. Twenty-six. Kind of an esoteric and uncommon entity. Anyone know what this is? Cerebral fibroadenoma of mascara. Very nice. Syringo fibroadenoma of mascara. You get a bonus point for eponyms. Other times people call this an acrosyringeal nevus. Uh, nevus not being related to melanocytes in this case. These can be single or can be multiple. Sometimes they can have like a linear arrangement when they're multiple which I think is where the, the nevus kind of name came in, like kind of like how epidermal nevus grows. Uh, sometimes they can look like that. Um, I've only rarely seen these in practice. And they can also be, a, this can, you can see the same kind of appearance as a reactive phenomenon overlying other types of things. So um, I feel like most uh, often they are on the leg, but they've been described in a wide variety of sites. They have elongated, thin um, uh, strands of uh, coming down from the epidermis to really get like long and thin, and then they anastomose and interconnect. And then in the middle of those strands, there are sweat duct spaces, okay? So they're kind of like, like an acrosyringeal. I kind of like the acrosyringeal nevus name for the fact that it points out these are basically like a bunch of acrosyringia that have grown really long and fused with their neighbors. And here it's ulcerated. And uh, then they also have a lot of fibrosis and reactive changes in the stroma. So the other thing that you could think of here is it kind of has a little bit of overlap with syringocystadenoma papilliferum, right? And you could also think a little bit of a poroma, although in poroma, I feel like the fingers that come down are much, uh, much broader and, and wider. And these are very thin, narrow strands that come down. And then they all, like each one has a duck, nice duck lumen. Whereas in poroma, you often have to hunt around for the ducks here. Like every single strand has dilated space in it. See, there, 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 there. It's like all the acrosyringia fusing together. So syringofibroadenoma or um, uh, acrosyringeal nevus, if you like. 27. Look, it's another syringoma, right? And it's got that perfect, dense, sclerotic collagen stroma that's all its own and totally separate from the, you know, the eyelid, edematous eyelid um, dermis over here. And then the uh, little round circles. This one has clear cell change also, and it's got the dried sweat secretion um, inside of it. And sometimes you'll see the little tadpole shape like here, but other times they'll just be little tiny circles, syringoma. 28. A little bit challenging, huh? What to do with this? Any ideas? Yeah, it's bad something, right? It's very infiltrative and atypical, infiltrating all through the dermis in between the collagen. In some places, you can see little little ducts or glands, or, or suspicious for little ducts or glands. Like, uh, but it's kind of hard to tell because there's a lot of holes here that are artifactual, and a lot of the cells are kind of uh, making these kind of narrow cords, right, of single file cells running between collagen. So, what what uh, kind of cancer often does that? Yeah, metastatic breast carcinoma. Not, it's not the only thing, but it is definitely when I see cells that look like that, I often want to think of metastatic breast cancer. And uh, in this case, it's a little challenging because we normally think of metastatic carcinomas as being in the dermis. But look at this. 
here we do have some gland formation and we have them getting into the epidermis. There's an area that was even better than this. Like here, there are actually tumor cells in the epidermis. Normally when we see that, we think of a primary from the skin if it's in the epidermis, but there are exceptions. Just like when melanoma metastasizes, it can grow back up from the dermis into the epidermis and we call that epidermotropic metastasis. You can also see that in other tumors, including metastatic carcinomas. I've seen a variety of different metastatic carcinomas have epidermotropism and grow into the overlying epidermis. And so it's important to recognize that that can happen so that you don't mistake this and think that it's a, a primary just because it has epidermal involvement. I've even seen, like I saw an epithelioid sarcoma once that had a skin metastasis with epidermotropism. That was the wildest thing ever. That was a crazy case. Thankfully, we knew the history. I don't know how I would have recognized it otherwise. So the, you know, you might say, well, how, how do I know it's a met? Well, I think anytime you see an epidermal tumor that has malignant features in the skin that doesn't look like normal basal or squame or any of the described tumors, you know, then you have to think, could it be a metastasis? And so that's, that's kind of the way I think about and approach this. And if you have one stain, a good stain to do is P63 or P40, because most, not all, but most skin adnexal tumors and tumors of the epidermis, basal, squame, and most benign and malignant adnexal tumors in the skin are going to have positivity for p63 and p40 whereas most adenocarcinomas from internal organs are going to be negative for those markers there are some exceptions some breast cancers can stain for them um, occasionally lung cancers uh, lung adenos can have p63 and squamous cell carcinomas that are metastatic doesn't matter where they're from they all stain the same so if you have squame for the lung met to the skin it's going to stain just like a cutaneous squame so that trick only works for um, adenocarcinoma metastatic versus primary skin. If it's if it's strongly positive for P63 or P40, that is supportive of a skin primary. It's not perfect, but it's supportive. All right, so that's epidermotropic metastatic breast cancer. And of course, the history is the most important thing in these situations. What do you guys think? Yeah, this is squamous cell carcinoma in situ Bowens that has lots of pagetoid spread, really abundant. Sometimes, I mean, this one doesn't even really have very many areas of full thickness atypia, but if I see keratinocytes that are very atypical with pagetoid spread, I'll call that squam in situ based on the pagetoid spread of the keratinocytes, uh, even if I don't find any like definitive full thickness areas. Look, I mean, striking atypia here, a lot of mitotic activity in these. So usually it's not very hard to oh, hear. There are some full thickness areas, but they're pretty focal. This one just has dramatic, oh there, that's nice full thickness, but dramatic pagetoid spread. And of all the pagetoid things, pagetoid squamous cell carcinoma in situ is the most common one I see by far. I see way more pagetoid squames than melanoma and way, way more of both of those than Paget's disease. Thirty. nodule in the subcutis. This is an old slide. Look at that. This is what happens in old good slides. This is what happens to the mounting media over many years. It starts to kind of dry out and make this rainbow of colors. What's this? Yeah, once you've seen this, it's very easy to recognize using metastatic renal cell nests of cells with clear or pale pink cytoplasm. There are a lot of different types of renal cells, so they don't all look just like this, but this is the classic kind of clear cell type. And then in between the nests, you have these anastomosing blood-filled vascular channels. So that's a very characteristic thing, not just the clear cells, but these va that vascular network is very, very characteristic of renal cell carcinoma. They're very bloody metastases, and they do metastasize the skin relatively often. And often I feel like I see them most on the scalp, but they can really be at any site. And PAX-8 would be a marker that would stain these, and there are a variety of other markers for renal cell carcinomas. History, of course, important there, or getting scans. And then the final case, 31. Great example. Yeah, so as you guys know, I lump kind of all the aggressive subtypes of basal cell carcinoma and usually just call them infiltrative type, which covers more theiform, micronodular, and other ones that have overlap between those. But this is a good, this is the one to burn in your mind as a classic example of what true morphiaform looks like. For one thing, look at how 
densely sclerotic the dermis is, just like morphia, right? And you can imagine that this would look like a firm, depressed, whitish plaque on the patient's skin because their dermis is like a solid rock of dense collagen. And in that dense sclerotic stroma, sometimes it's more cellular than this too, is the, are these tiny little basaloid strands of basal cell carcinoma that are just a couple cells thick, two or three cells thick, and they're stranding out in between. So yeah, if you just had an area like this, you could wonder, is it desmoplastic trichoep? Is it microcystic adnexal carcinoma? If you're having a really bad day, you could think syringoma, but usually syringoma has obvious ducts. So I feel like it's easy. But I would say the vast majority of the times when I've seen more feiform basal cell, if you look around, there will be other areas like so that look more like classic traditional basal cell. So yeah, on a really small biopsy, you could struggle. You know, people include this in the Paisley tie differential. But in real life, I find that this is rarely a struggle because usually there'll be other elements that are more nodular. And then here you've got the palisading and the mucin-filled clefts. And you can see a nice clefting over here also. See? See good clefting? So usually you'll find some areas that look like that. But in the most morpheiform areas, you don't get good palisading. You don't get good mucin or clefting. You don't have the typical stroma. It's more dense stroma. So in these areas, yeah, you could struggle with figuring out what this is. But just look around and find the other areas of obvious basal cell. And that usually will solve the problem for you in most cases. All right, guys. And that brings us to the end. Morpheiform basal cell. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend.